Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this topic of large deviations and uncertainty quantification. And um, it's a subject that is relatively new for me, that I got into it uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, it mentions the uh, part of energy grant that the mechanical engineering department well, then I play a small role in this. Uh, started out, and just say a couple of things about the setup. We started out as a, it, it is uh, really promoted by the National Labs, very difficult to find uncertainty as uh, part of the overall uh, process of what they're doing. They really want to do it. And it started out in a kind of a lukewarm way. The mechanical, One way, the mechanical engineers didn't quite know what to make of it. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Uh, I, there were moments where I was a little bit cynical about it, but I think four years on, uh, this has taken a dimension that's I think quite interesting, mathematically, scientifically, so to speak. So I'd like to convey some of the ideas that emerged from, uh, from this discussion and, and the, the interaction between the mechanical engineering community, mechanical and aero, and myself and the more mathematics, the applied math community, has been very good. I want to then um, discuss this a little bit. Then I want to talk about linear, linear waves in random media. This is what something I've been working on for many years. And I want to say a couple of things about this uh, and go to nonlinear waves and contrast what happens between having linear waves in uh, linear wave propagation as you would in a, in a, in a seismic situation and then have nonlinear ways. What's the difference when, you, when they're both propagating in strongly in homogeneous media? If you, if you know the answer, think about it, you will see something interesting happens. You may already know it. Uh, and the application, of course, for nonlinear waves, a very good application is the flood search of a rough topography, the same topic that was presented yesterday. Okay, so first of all, what about uncertainty quantification? What about the it, uh, It's an emerging field. As I experienced it, as I lived through it the last four years, that it's primarily driven by the perceived dead end, and this is a long term, uh, into which very large scale scientific community and complex mathematical modeling is heading. That is, the diminished ability of the results of them. The fact that people can be supercomputers and have very uh, extensive models and they present very, uh, very, uh, very results of very complex computations. Instead of, they, they have reached a point of diminishing returns where, where people are simply are not believing what is coming across. They, have, they, they don't have a method by which they can convey and really get their results. And I think that's what the mind of the, uh, the national labs. I've done to convince the And they said well, there had to be a different party in the community. You have to find a way to communicate your results, your computational science results, in a way that uh, attests to their credibility. And that's where we do it. So this is a complex model kind of model assumption. Modern uncertainty, that sometimes we call it the extended uncertainty, there's a jargon that is emerging this. A lot of parameters, uh, on a lot of parameters that are not <coughs> only statistically fixed, they are not at all. Or boundary additional conditions that affect the animal environment to do some more job records. Whatever you're doing is not operating in the back, it's operating in some context of, of which there are influences. So all these things contribute to uh, the uncertainty or the identity of the populations and they have to be accepted. So in short, that's the computing has discovered so that the analysis is almost inevitable that people who compute as uh, do scientific computing, they have to uh, uh, 
somehow getting this statistical methodology in the field for that model and so on. And it's interesting because uh, my, my experience at Stanford, for example, with the uh, Pascal teaching course with graduate first year graduate engineers, who forgot the methods in introduction to statistics, and have a lot of those students or so. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a challenging course, it's not really that basic. But I would say that the, the culture, not in electrical engineering, but in mechanical engineering, in aerospace engineering, is that it's any name in statistical and so on, but I can figure it out that statistics is the sort of thing that I can sweep under the rug. And the, the, the reality is that the best in the practice in the mechanical engineering department are functionally illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> and so UQ is really forcing that on this, this UQ, the culture of the human. You see, four years on this project, there's a number of uh, students that have been funded by this uh, deal with Brown. Uh, how they really scramble it, so this is they really want to understand what's basic and what's this, what's the others, etc. etc. It's very eye-opening to see what's become my course as a side issue. So, and these issues are not limited to engineering or scientific problems. They permeate all modern mathematical models, including mathematical finance, as projected in the future. And mathematical finance is somewhat a little bit like the geoscientist, and it's very, very data driven. In fact, it is the only emerging science with the only thing that exists in mathematical finance today. There are no models in mathematical very dangerous to write down the model in mathematics because it's very likely it's not. It's very likely it's not. It's it's not. It's it's data. Data. And from data, and from data you, have you have to make inferences. Okay, so for me, I'm going to uh, uh, complex for random media. What are the main results? I mean, this has been a subject that's been around since after the Second World War. The early papers on there's a very early paper by Lord Rayleigh in 1918, an old man in 1918, close to his death. He wrote a paper, a one-dimensional wave propagation in random media, which was a, an eye-opener for me when I saw this many years ago. And he predicted correctly several of the things. Uh, it was a, I don't have time to, to go into the history of this paper. If anybody's interested, I can tell you what he has in there. But it really appeared, uh, waves in random media, appeared right after the, first, the Second World War in the 1940s. There are some papers on multiple scattering that appeared. They were motivated by uh, nuclear sciences, but also by atmospheric sciences, radar in particular. And then they flourished in the 60s and 70s. The Russians did a lot of work in that area. And now it's a, it's a kind of a mature field. And you might say, coming from the geosciences, not, not having thought about this, uh, what are the main results? What has been achieved in the last 50, 60 years in this field? And uh, first of all, there are some simple things that, that waves are waves that propagate in an inhomogeneous medium are primarily affected by inhomogeneities that are that that are on a scale, on a spatial scale that is comparable to the wavelength. In other words, if you have inhomogeneities that are uh, more or less on, on fine scales, and you send a a, a long uh, a wave with long wavelength, it will not see them. Uh, and that might explain why, for example, that in, uh, in global uh, seismology, uh, random media doesn't play such a big role. On the other hand, um, uh, as they advance, if, if you have, if you have a, a strongly in home lithosphere and wave energy is trapped in the surface, near surface waveguide of the Earth, then there's a lot of multiple scattering there. And uh, what, what you find is that very quickly, wave fronts disintegrate into CODA. And CODA theory uh, in, in seismology is a, is a subject in its own right. It was uh, the, uh, the pioneer in this field was Katie Aki, the late Katie Aki, who uh, understood the importance of CODA in, uh, in, in seismic, uh, in all sorts of uh, fields in, in seismic uh, science. And, uh, and many others. And, uh, followed. Uh, I, I can't quite mention names right now. Uh, they escaped me. I, it would take me too much time to go through this. Uh, the main result is, is that there is this conversion from, uh, from coherent energy that moves with the front of the wave into incoherent energy that goes into the coda. And that the theory, the mathematical theory, has done very nicely, I think, has understood that. I worked very hard on this. 
And for many, for many things, for isotropic versus anisotropic, there's a huge difference in random control in random media. It's not, it's not just a technical thing. And there is a new phenomenon of wave localization that occurs in strongly uh, layered media, which is hard to see in, in real geophysical problems, but you have to look in very special circumstances to see. One of the things that, uh, uh, that came up, it's easy to explain, it's a sound bite, is the following, that w uh, and this was, this result, uh, a lot of these results for, for random media were motivated by, by the um, test ban treaty verification seismology that flourished until, until the uh, Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, and that, that, field, that research stopped being promoted. And it was the following, when you have wave energy trapped in the, um, in the near surface uh, waveguide, then, uh, and you look at the coda and you try to figure out how much energy in the wave is in the, in the shear wave and how much is in the P wave. And you find, this is an empirical evidence, that the ratio of energy from shear to uh, compressional waves are the order of 10 to 1. In other words, 10 times more shear wave energy than compressional wave energy. This is an empirical law. It was very interesting that if there is such a law, uh, where does it come from? And it was a, I think it was, a, it was an interesting success of the theory that it comes out of an ergodic theory. It comes out of multiple scattering. It's not, a lot of people attempted to explain it with single scattering. It's not a single scattering phenomenon. It's really a multiple scattering phenomenon, and it has a very nice explanation. I think it's this theory. Uh, in exploration, the, the, where is the UQ? What is the uncertainty quantification of this? It is in imaging. I think it's the modern imaging is all about uncertainty quantification. Modern seismic imaging, uh, primarily in exploration geophysics, is really a, a, a study of the trade-off between resolution and signal-to-noise ratio. You, you try to improve resolution, you use more data, uh, you, might be, you might lose your signal-to-noise ratio. It's a, it's, a, it's a highly, it's a massively data-driven science. I think it's a, it's a beautiful field for, for applied mathematics, for people who are interested in modern applied mathematics. Seismic imaging, I was telling Ridge a, a few minutes ago, that it's a subject that, that is, uh, has the potential to be at the very core of modern applied mathematics, interdisciplinary imaging science. Uh, it, what about nonlinear waves? This is all about linear waves. For nonlinear waves, uh, the, 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 the striking thing is, is that randomness all of a sudden becomes relatively insignificant. Nonlinear waves are extraordinarily stable. And are not easily influenced by homogeneities, contrary to what happens in linear wave propagation. You need different methods. You can't try to understand linear waves by the same uh, nonlinear waves by the same methods that you use for linear waves. You cannot do it. And uh, a good application of this is flooding over complex topography. You really want to find it's a it's a surging. You have a, a very complex topography, like a, a coastal area or, or or an urban environment. And you, you want to, it's a highly complex topography, uh, and you want to see how uh, the, the, the flood is surging into this region. How do you quantify that? Uh, very complex equations. The shallow water equations are a very poor way to describe what happens over rough topography. Shallow water equations are a depth average kind of equation. How can you do depth averaging when the topography is all over the place? So uh, there are very interesting questions about how do you quantify the uncertainty? into this dimension reduction that comes with a depth averaging, how do you really rationalize the depth averaging by adding UQ to it. So, uh, and one of the things that uh, pushes itself on you, I think, is the large deviation theory, which I think is a good tool for, for doing just what I suggested. And now let me, let me explain to you in a very simple context what large deviation theory can do. So you consider for simplicity a scalar viscous conservation law with small additive noise. So I consider the simplest conservation law, which is one-dimensional, u is a function of t and x, and there is a flux function f of u, it's a convex function, and think of it as f equals u squared, like it would be in the Berger's equation. There is, a, there is a diffusive term, and there is an external forcing Brownian term. This could be a topography. There are many, many models, many, many physical models that boil down to this sort of thing with a w, some kind of an environmental effect. Uh, you might say, what about time, if it's environmental, why is it changing in time if it's topography? It could be because you're, you're in a moving frame. There are many reasons how the, how the time might be here. But for the theory, I might as well assume it's time. 
it's easy to, to convert it to time if I don't have it by moving into moving coordinates. And then this W is really a Brownian motion field, which means that it's a collection of, of uh, Gaussian random variables at T and X, which have this cross correlation function at two different time space points, Tx and T prime X prime, which is given by the minimum, this wedge means minimum of T and T prime, and um, phi multiplied by phi adjoint, which is this, this integral thing, uh, this is in continuous space. Now, due to the uncertainty in the randomness, the shock structure, this, this, uh, the unperturbed problem su su supports shocks, wavefronts that propagate in, in a certain way. So what about, how do, how will the, what will the randomness do? The, it's possible that, uh, that the way that the shock as it goes through this random medium has the external front will, will disintegrate, will just, will just break up and you won't see it. Doesn't happen. It's an extremely, it's an extremely uh, strong structure, but what might happen is it might displace itself. You expect it to be here. The shock is advancing. The surge is advancing. You expect it to be there but it's actually a little bit further ahead or it, it's somewhere to the side. How could that happen? So on, with what probability can it happen? Because it, this, this is going to be a deviation that is created by the noise. And the large deviation principle says that if you consider a set of solutions, a set of, of, uh, of well, a set of views, they don't quite have to be solutions, a set of views that have some property. For example, they're in, they're in the wrong place. They're not quite solutions. They're in the wrong place from where they should be with respect to the unperturbed problem. Then you can calculate the very small probability uh, with which uh, that event uh, would occur by this exponential formula that, that reduces everything to a variational problem. This, there is a rate function, I of u, which is a weight residual with respect to the conservation law. It's on the next slide. And it says calculate this weighted residual. So you're calculating very, very small probabilities now. This is the probability of a rare event happening. Epsilon is a measure of the strength of the external perturbations that, that you're putting in there. And I can get rid of the epsilon. I, I can put everything into a, in a robust form by saying, all that really interests me is not individual probabilities. When I'm considering large deviations, I'm not really interested in finding out how small is the probability, because that's, a, that's an unusual thing to try to calculate. I want to know, is this event much more unlikely to happen than another event. It's the relative probability that is robust. And here's, a, here's how you do it. You define that ratio R, this index, which is a, the logarithm of the probability of the event A happening over the logarithm of B. According to this uh, large deviation formula, it is the ratio of two calculus of variation from this I of Q, which is here, and I by. And when you uh, write this without the log, you can see what you determine is all you're going to be computing is this exponent r. This exponent r is so which you can put for a you can calculate speeds and magnet, more or less, let's say 10 to the minus 2 is what you And now it's 3. Okay? 10 to the minus 2. This is, this is a 10 to the minus 6 problem. This you may be able to calculate somehow by solving by using the cloud or something. It's relatively okay. But this one you can never calculate, it's 10 to the minus 6. But you have a very good estimate for this power. Not only you have a good estimate, but this is your bar. You can get error bars for this. Both for every standing and for other kind of concern. So that's the spirit. If you look for something that has a robustness, you can put your computation on it. It doesn't mean that it's easier to compute. Easier to compute. It's not easy to compute. It's a very hard computation, but it's the right computation from the point of view of uncertainty quantification. And here's what this function looks like. It's it's a mess. It's a it's a very complicated thing. It's a weighted residual. It says, look at the um, take a function u space time, and look at how how well it satisfies the, the uh, conservation law. Look at the residual. Weight the residual with respect to the square root of the covariance of the noise space time covariance, and then integrate out over time. Take the L2 norm. And so this is exactly what it is. Now, this is not an easy thing to calculate. And of course, to do the optimization over this, this is not a convex functional U. It's a very complicated object. But the miracle is, is that, and we don't understand this, I must say, is that even though this is not a convex functional U in most cases, uh, and it could be you know, in, in, in discretizations that you will see even in the simple problem, you have to do an optimization over thousands of variables when you discretize in space and time this U. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, the optimization 
is remarkably fast and accurate. This really shocked me. I, I was expecting this. This was a, is a Jew way. Is a graduate student. I told him that it was it was a big. Uh, he, he lucked out for a graduate student. To I, I thought it was gonna. I didn't tell him. I gave him this problem, and I was worried that it wasn't gonna work. I fully expected him to come back complain to me that I was crazy that I had suggested this problem, and miraculously this thing worked and it works at the level of MATLAB with, with package software. It's really amazing. There's something going on here that we don't understand in terms of the uh, this calculus of variations problem. Now here's I want to show some results, some numerical results, and I take the I'm going to speed up a little bit. I'm going to take the uh, uh, move into, into uh, moving uh, coordinates into traveling wave coordinates with speed gamma, and then I I write the equation for the Burgess equation. It looks like that. Gamma is the, the speed of the of the traveling wave. I denote the traveling wave by u naught. It's a traveling wave that is like has some state at one end, some state at the other. The Hugonio condition it determines the speed gamma, the, the difference uh, between the left and the right state. And so uh, now I ask, uh, we're interested in a case where u at capital T. Of course, uh, if there is no Brownian perturbation. U naught is an exact solution of this equation in the traveling frame. U naught is an exact solution; it's a traveling wave. But now I ask, what's the probability that I start with this U naught and then at time t later, it's displaced? And let's let's see some calculations. So here's here's what here's what uh, this is a displacement. So I start initially with a U naught, and then I say at time capital T, U naught is displaced. So this is the initial step. And as I say, calculate with this calculus of variations problem, the most likely, or this will be the most likely path that uh, will, uh, will realize the most likely the, 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 the minimizer of the calculus of variations project as a function of patient time is this one here. That doesn't look like the time in the way. This is the, this is the path of minimum probability. What so is interesting here is look at this high function, the value of this figure at seven point Five nine five. That is equal to one. If you take a, a front that is much sharper, this one here. Look at how big the the i function is at is eleven. It's almost a factor of two or one and a half. That r it says that this one is much more likely to occur than this one. Exponentially so because the i function is small. So this one is a lot more stable than that. Now that's something that is really valuable. It says that sharper fronts are much more stable. In other words, the idea that you're going to prepare this, the idea that an event like this happening, this is what is propagating. The idea that this would be with finding an express state, the idea that this would happen, forget it, and never happen. This might happen, depending on the context. But this one is exponentially small. And the same thing, it's even grammatically so when you have to change the speed. functions, 200, 206. This is a, an event that's astronomically small probability of happening. This is what I mean by stability of, of nonlinear wave propagation, random media. Okay, um, I'm going to, how much time do I have? 10 more minutes, okay. So I went far, I, well, I'm sure you have questions on this. I'm going to switch to something entirely different. So take a, take a second to clear your head. Uh, Okay. Uh, it, I want to talk about systemic risk and uh, systemic risk or systemic failure. Okay, and I want to first say some general things about why is that interesting? How did I get how did I get into it? Is it of interest to geosciences? This is a question to you. I don't have an answer to it. I, I took a chance to present it here just because I'm working. It. I've been working it for the last year and a half, and I, I, I'm very excited. I think it's an interesting problem. And what it really is, is it's really a study of dynamic phase transitions. If you're a physicist, all I'm doing is dynamic phase transitions and special class of dynamic phase transitions. So uh, it, nothing, nothing unusual that way. It's just doing it with stochastic methods. OK. And what is systemic risk, and why is it interesting? So. It, it arose out of this UQ, this uncertainty quantification, this Department of Energy. Uh, it, was, it was pressure from, uh, we, uh, by the way, Thursday and Friday, 
this program is being reviewed and all these guys from, from the national labs come over at Stanford and uh, they ask extremely sharp questions. They, they, they really, I, I got a lot out of, the, of this interaction with this group. Uh, they were asking these questions indirectly. It was, I, I won't say what the, what the project is that Stanford is doing, but they were really asking these questions. How do you do this? They were not asking it in the mathematical way I'm presenting it, but they were, that's what they wanted to know. So consider an evolving system with a large number of interconnected components. The key word here is interconnected, each of which can be in a normal or in a failed state. That's the simplest thing. You have a system that is, can be normal and in a failed state. Okay? And the question is, we want to study the probability of, the over, of an overall failure. In other words, we're not interested in the probability that any one component will fail. We want to know what's the probability that a very large percentage of the components will simultaneously fail. Okay, that's what the systemic risk is about. And now I want to study it in terms of three parameters here. I want to introduce three variables into this, into this model. One is the intrinsic stability of each component. In other words, uh, you want to say this is a bistable system and how stable is it? How, how uh, stable is, how unlikely is it to go from one state to the other for each component? Then the strength of the external random perturbations. How much, how much external perturbation each, each component feels a certain perturbation? It could be thermal, it could be you name it. Okay? And then the degree of interconnectedness of the cooperation. This is the last one, of course, is the mathematically interesting one. They're interconnected. And so they, they share the, the loads, that, 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 uh, the, the, the shocks are being seen by, seen by one of them are felt indirectly by the others. So here, the, here are the uh, possible applications. Engineering systems with a large number of interconnected parts. Components can fail, but the system fails only when a large number of components fails simultaneously. That's the application, the Stanford application. Power distribution systems, that's the earliest in my uh, uh, experience over the years. This is the earliest uh, concrete field where this kind of failure was uh, recent research, substantial research in this area has been done, and that is power distribution systems. Individual components of a system, of a, of a power distribution system, are calibrated with trans fluctuations in demand by sharing loads. Okay, then, but sharing also increases the probability of over overall failure. In other words, you all know that uh, uh, what happens in some hot summer in New York City when uh, some lady in Queens turns on a switch and the whole northeast goes down the power. That's systemic failure, okay? And of course, if, if you don't like the lady in Queens, you can think about banking systems. Banks cooperate. That's sovereign there, please. That's not just generalizing. <laughs> Let me talk generally. Okay, banking systems. Banks cooperate by spreading risk uh, of credit shocks. They cooperate with each other, uh, and and then uh, they can function with different what they call the Basel rules, which are the rules that tell you how much uh, reserves a bank can have. So if a bank has a lot of reserves, it's relatively insensitive to shocks. So a bank is really a bistable system. Either it can, it can be in a, in, a, in a safe state or it can be in a failed state. And it can be in a healthy state or in a failed state. And uh, the external shocks are credit shocks. So that means that certain of their, of their uh, creditors are unable to uh, fulfill their obligations. And the bank all of a sudden thinking that it's gonna, it has a certain amount of capital, it doesn't really have that capital and it's in a state of failure. On the other hand, the banks are being helped by their neighbors and uh, by the other banks. So the banking system cooperates. I mean, if a bank is in trouble, uh, the other banks lend to them. But here's the interesting thing, and this is what the main result of the, of the, of the mathematical analysis. This, this can replace banks by insurance companies. Spreading the risk is really helpful. It really, it really says that the banks, for example, can operate in a more, in a more risky way. They can reduce their reserves, make, make higher profits. But it increases, the, it increases the risk that the whole system will fail. Who is counting? Who is watching? Everybody is worried about their own bank failing. And by sharing the risk, 
they know that, okay, that is mitigating the effect of a possible credit shock. Who is watching that the whole banking system is not going to fail because everybody is cooperating? Okay, that's presumably the Federal Reserve or a central banker or something or maybe nobody. Okay, so here's a mathematical model. You have a risk variable or whatever that failure might be, which is, uh, which is denoted by xj. Don't ask me what it is exactly because that's really a, a very difficult thing to, to say and there's a long story behind it. So this xj is a, is a real variable. A j is, labels the components, there are n of them. And there are the three quantities here. The first one is uh, a force that tends to keep you into one of the two stable states. There is a potential, which is a bi stable state. Is your y as So uh, it's a bi stable potential. I have the figure in the next slide. So this is, a, this is a force that tends to keep you, that first term is a force that tends to keep you in one of the two states. The last term is the external gravity shock. Uh, the external random shock that comes from the uh, initial uh, moment. And this middle term is the cooperation. Said that every, every individual member uh, tries very hard to behave like the average. X bar is the empirical average of the risk. So the rule is that if you behave uh, as close as you can, uh, in the way your neighbors behave, that should ask a little the system. So, if theta is large, if theta is such that the theta is large, that means that, that, means that, that the individual uh, components of the system very quickly react and, and mean revert back to the empirical mean. If they don't do that, if the theta is relatively small, then the system is kind of sleepy, it doesn't respond quickly, and that suggests that it might be systemic. Okay. That's in fact what happens. That the theta is very important. Right? When you have the diversity of all the theta, the theta is high for northern Europe and the theta is low for southern Europe. But it's only more or less the dynamics of how the type more or less the dynamics of how various other components, how various um, components of the system respond to obeying the rules. To obeying the rules. So, okay. Okay. Let me just show you the, the potential. This is a figure that's right. Here's the, this is a figure that's right. You have a bi potential. It's like a double risk. But you have two other potential. And the bi-stable potential is in some state. Let's say it's in good state. And the noise is determined. But there isn't so much noise that the function goes. If the noise is sufficiently small, the external shock is sufficiently small, but the depth of the well is sufficiently deep, then it will stay more or less in this state. Except that there is a small probability that a large shock will come and will kick it over. But that can happen for one, two, or three, but what's the probability that will happen for most of them? So what's the probability that the X bar is going to be the best? That's the large deviation problem. That's a problem that was solved very elegantly. More than 20 years ago by Dawson and Gardner, two mathematicians. And, uh, and uh, this is what I want to describe, and, uh, for, this is what I want to describe for a couple of minutes more. Uh, Let me just say a couple of things. A couple of things. Uh, why is this model? Why this model? You might say, well, where did this model come from? In some sense, this is the simplest model. In some sense, this is the simplest model that I could think of so that has this model. Except the main result, 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 the the idea, of cooperation, the idea of cooperation as, mitigation of as a mitigator risk. of individual risk has the consequence that it increases the system of risk. So that's what uh, very nice, uh, a very nice uh, application of life deviation theory. Here's one of the main results of this thing is that uh, this uh, I it's really a large equation and some variational problem that is the analog of this rate function that I had before. I will skip that because I think I'm... How is my time? Let me just uh, simply, simply uh, finish with, my, with this slide. 
because I think this is something that uh, might might uh, bring some uh, thoughts to you. Interconnected systems have many sources of instability, and it, you know, if you're thinking about possible applications of this uh, in in the financial world, uh, I took I took a lot of the comments that were really financial oriented. The financial world is is a completely unstable system. It's a miracle that uh, we function from day to day without the instabilities breaking out. If you start looking at the, at the system between liquidity and uh, volatility, all, all the components that make up the system, it's amazing that there is some kind of a dynamic equilibrium that we're following. So in order to understand how uh, a complex system like the financial world deals with these instabilities, you really have to understand systemic risk. On the other hand, you might say, what about this mean field model? That's not a realistic model for banking. So there's a, um, the first thing that you can do is you can convert everything. Nothing can be computed analytically, by the way. Everything, everything boils down to, to rather large numerical computations here, too. So uh, there's no implication that this large deviation theory somehow simplifies things. It's just the right quantity to look at. It's not the simplest or the, the quickest. Uh, so one thing that you can do is you can you can convert everything you know you can hide all these theoretical things and build a, a numerical algorithm from one end to the end with, which doesn't really see this uh, this rate function is built into the algorithm and that's that's what important sampling is and it's a very uh, this is something that we are developing right now and I think it's, a, it's really a good way to convince people who who are kind of allergic to too much theory uh, the other thing is, can dynamic control mechanisms uh, help mitigate risk? That's not of interest to geophysics because there's no, there's no way that in geophysics you can intervene and stop something from happening. Uh, the other thing that is interesting here is hierarchical and diversified models of systemic risk. There's a vast number of other models you can think of. Hierarchical in terms of scales, uh, systems that have a, a dominant mode. There are any, any number of things you can do. And there are very interesting algebraic, mathematical algebraic problems that come up. In connection with this. And the last moment is, is that, that it just occurred to me as I was thinking about this, uh, does this have anything to do with the phenomenology of the onset of earthquakes? And I, I leave that, this is my last comment. Thank you. Uh, I'm really intrigued by your last question there. Um, I think there is something. Uh, similar in the earthquake process because when we talk about large earthquake is basically a simultaneous failure of many small segments and patches. But uh, since you do not have time to elaborate on what we can learn by doing these mathematical models to better understand the system. So I'm asking a question to give you a chance to talk about um, what we can learn from here. Well, building on my mind today, I think what you did what you're really asking is, you don't want me to say, well, you just tell, first of all, you have to design the model in a way that you think realistically describes this phenomenon. It's not going to be a mean field model, it's going to be more complicated. Then you have to, uh, uh, to calculate something. Now, you can calculate as, as well as I can. What will the mathematics tell you to do? The mathematics will tell you, uh, will simply very economically point you to what to calculate. It will tell you, design the model. Maybe it will guide you to how to simplify the model and, and, and uh, remove excessive complexity that is really unnecessary. And then it will tell you how to look for, how to, uh, to formulate a problem so that the calculation is efficient. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be relatively efficient. And it's going to, lead, it's going to go to that index. So the, the takeaway message from me is, don't try to calculate the small probabilities that an earthquake will happen but try to calculate something logarithmic, like an index. And uh, I, you have to put priors in it. I'm not exactly sure how to say that, but that's my intuition. Of course, going to start at the same point and go, perhaps take it a step further. I think one of the things that's very interesting here that we've learned in the last 20 years is that perturbations in the Earth, which appear to cause earthquakes, phenomenologically they do, are much too small to make that happen. In other words, we are, we, if, we, if we have an earthquake, 
if the changes in stress resulting from that earthquake do appear to cause other earthquakes. But at face value, the perturbations involved are much too small for that to be physically possible. But yet, at the same time, it's a robust observation. Right. And I think that I think that there is a very so my thing is very similar to me. I think there's a very good chance. I I I I didn't want to stick my neck out. I stick my neck out to say it out loud because I could have been uh, taken down. But uh, I thought I thought that uh, I thought it is something like that. That it's you know if I put it in, in terms of a in terms of a banking system, which I thought a lot more about. You know you can be in a situation where all the banks are operating conservatively. Look, my reserves are good. I satisfy the Basel rules and so on. Uh, credit shocks are what they are. Uh, everybody's cooperating. And you could be operating so damn close to a threshold for systemic risk, and you don't know it. You do not know that a small change in the credit behavior can bring the whole system down. In other words, a small event can result in the transition which at that particular moment, everybody thought everything was okay. Yeah, I think, I think, I think there's a very... I think Dave would agree with the statement that, you know, wouldn't you also that we, we are finding increasingly the perturbations that seem much too small to do anything are in fact... I mean, the, phenom the phenomenology is much too convincing by now for this not to be true. But yet at the same time, theoretically, you know, it's like the stress is involved with you if I, if I touched your forehead, okay? And yet, when you calculate that mathematically, that's that's the stuff to induce an earthquake. You say this is ludicrous. So I think you're on to something very. I think there's a possibility that this is a, a uh, very interesting way to think about this. By the way, it's not a mean field model because obviously. By the way, it's not a mean field model because obviously, when you when you're talking about the the fault structure and components inside the fault that that have to, you know, in order to get a large earthquake, somehow the release has to be simultaneously for all of them. They're all more or less critical, and a little one falls, and then it spreads out the fault. But there are models, there are ways to, to model this. It doesn't have to be a mean field model. You can put this into the model. I haven't done it, but there is literature on this, uh, by others. One other comment I would make, if I were remembering that, with the, the relative proportions of S wave and shear wave and compressional wave energy, remember that if you're in a, a homogeneous whole space, yes. so there's no, there's no scattering of yes. anything, yes. and you yes. simply look at the Green's function, yes. you yes. will generate S wave energy. P wave energy in a ratio of proportional to cubic velocities. So in other words, if you simply have an earthquake in the homogeneous medium, on average the S wave energy is five times greater. Not necessarily ten. Yeah. Oh no, 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 I'm saying ten, I think. I, I don't know. Oh no, I'm saying I'm not talking about scattering. Oh yeah, in the, yeah. Right, right, right. And that's it. That's exactly the starting point. So the starting point was, in other words, if you look at this black body radiation and the microscope micro canonical equilibrium that you have, the thermodynamic equilibrium. And you try to extrapolate that to what happens in the waveguide, you get the wrong answer. This is where I got into this in the mid 90s. Yeah, I had I knew of the work of. It does require a factor two. Right, right. Right. So, 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 over what we expect, it's not a factor of ten. So what happens is when you add. So what happens is when you add into this waveguide structure, if you add in homogeneities, all it does is. Uh, at the, at the microscopic equilibrium of the corresponding radiative transport equations for the, for the wave energy, which is what the operative equations are when they're scattering, you go from the elastic wave equations to their analog at the level of radiative transport. And you look at the, what the microscope, microcanonical ensemble would be there, and that brings down the factor of 10 almost immediately. It's a cheap result if you know how to look at it. And it, it fits head on, uh, uh, on, the, on the correct result. I was, I was stung by this. I have a personal letter from Kate Yaki, who's a, who's a dear friend, who, who, uh, who was very surprised by this. He really, he really liked this result and you know, made, made, a, made a lot of me. Yeah. Because it was with the explosion, explosion generator, which was very much That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. That's right. He was very concerned about this, and it was a very central question during the test plan treaty years. This was dead central, because the question was, how do you distinguish an explosion, which is all compressional, from a, a shear generated wave, which is an earthquake? How do you distinguish the two? And the fact of the matter is, if you go sufficiently further down the waveguide, you can't tell the difference, because the scattering has converted everything to, uh, to shear waves. 
But there was another thing, there were, let's not get into that. There's some other things that happened that I think really, really solved that problem. The LG way, if you guys know this. It is in fact a scattered way, so the LG way is in fact what you're talking about. These yeah. refinements haven't done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Some people in France did them. Very 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 well. Well. Some people in France did them, and it worked very well. Regarding bullet number two here about the dynamic control mechanisms not being a geophysical problem. Seems to me there's an obvious one, and that is the collapse of the client system and uh, loss of ice sheets. And here is a case where uh, certainly a geophysical problem uh, where humans intervene in the system in which there are very strong interactions. But humans intervene, intervene not in a, in a systematic way. They, they don't intervene to, to cause some action. They intervene by their behavior. There's a certain behavior. What I mean by intervention here is like a control. You observe something. Yeah, you might say the following. You might say the following. If at some point the humankind decides to intervene and try to reverse the, the climate effects, what's the best way? The, 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 what's the best way to do it? You might ask that question that way. That would be an intervention that would be a controlled intervention rather than a behavioral uh, intervention that is just uh, behave as you, as you do. If you ask the question, what sh would you have to do to optimally reverse what has happened? And yeah. And then the controller might be the parameters of your model you use and essentially you're changing the question a little bit, but you're saying well, what sort of control should I have on my models to get some specific output. So it's it's a natural thing. The background, I think, the background I think you just to give you the, the economic background in this, uh, this is this is a, a problem with a long history. You know, there is a the free marketeers, the, the people who believe in, in free market capitalism, they, they don't want any intervention. So it's usually the Keynesians who are the interventionists. And there was a, in, in recent years, I, I would say uh, it kind of stopped in the 70s or so, 70s and 80s. There was a lot of work at the level of dynamical systems of when you have relatively simple ODE models, ordinary differential equation models for uh, an economic system and you put in the intervention effects and to see how government intervention or uh, agreement between labor and management, think cooperative agreements, how things like that would affect market, overall market behavior, macroeconomic behavior. This work kind of went out of style and people are much more interested, interested now into very diversified systems where the market formation is part of the equation, where, where volatility in markets, liquidity in markets are really players. Volatility means it's the sigma. Liquidity in the market is the volume, a many large number of components. This is a question there. The process could could lower that probability, and, and so maybe that. I mean, there are examples, you know, for small, smaller scale examples, where where an intervention in the way you have in mind would actually be relevant. Yeah, I think that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that uh, on a smaller scale, of course, stochastic uh, random effects, stochastic effects are much more interesting on a smaller scale, not on the, on the global geophysics scale. But if you look at uh, at exploration seismology, which is uh, on the 10, 15 kilometer square area, there are stochastic effects. If you go down to reservoir monitoring, which is what you're talking about, there uh, the scales are, are smaller uh, even, and there stochastic effects are much more important. And the intervention, and there's some very interesting things that are happening in this area. Uh, this is a very active area that I'm very, very, very much interested in, and uh, Martin is also. Uh, it's, um, it's an area which has a tremendous possibilities for mathematical research. A lot of things that are happening uh, in, in, the, in the immediate vicinity of reservoirs for cheap monitoring, possibly for intervention. Uh, some of them are being done, but some of them, a lot of opportunities, are, uh, the, the people who can do them are not doing them for lack of scientific manpower. I think people, the people who are involved in these kind of uh, things, they don't really know how to deal with their data. 
They don't give you their data. I gave a talk on, 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 on this, some of these ideas with this noise, uh, noise imaging that I mentioned. And there were people from Saint Berger in the audience and immediately understood what I was saying. And they promised to send me the data. A year and a half later, I don't have their data. They, they won't give it to me because, you know.